Notre Dame held their annual pro day on Thursday, and Audric Estime made himself some money. Plus, the mailbag is back. That's coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? Welcome into Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Friday, March 22nd, so happy Friday. And thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and now I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And you can find this show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. A quick reminder that if you're watching along on YouTube, please like the video below and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to the pod, please take a moment, rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe if you have not already. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Got a fun Friday show planned for you today. I'm going to be honest, I am recording this right after watching Pretty much an entire day, uh, entire day's worth of college basketball, and I just watched Samford get robbed in the final seconds against Kansas. So I'm kind of amped up right now, energetic, ready to have a great show. And the mailbag is back after a couple weeks off, so I'm excited about that. You guys delivered with your questions as always. I can tell it's almost transfer portal season again because you guys have a lot of questions about that, and I get it. The portal opens up again um, on April fifteenth, so just under a month from now, and Notre Dame is definitely going to address it in some capacity. There's going to be some guys who leave and they're probably going to try to add again in the transfer portal. So we'll get to that in segments two and three, but I want to start today's show with some thoughts about Notre Dame's pro day that they held on Thursday. Notre Dame had 11 players from last year's team participate, including Sam Hartman, Audric Estime, Blake Fisher, Joe Alt, Javante Jean-Baptiste, J.D. Bertrand, Maris Leofau, Thomas Harper, Cam Hart, plus specialists Spencer Schrader and Michael Vixen. Excuse me, Michael Vinson, uh, Milk as they call him. They also had a couple other former players participate as well, including wide receiver Avery Davis. Um, Bo Bauer was there. Joe Wilkins, who transferred to Miami of Ohio. He was back. Paul Mawala, who also transferred out, got to uh, participate in well, as well in the GOAT. John Sott, the punter, he was there too. I can't believe he hasn't found his way onto an NFL roster yet, but hopefully after this pro day, maybe he gets another shot in the NFL. It was a big showcase. There were some real notable attendees, including Mike McCarthy, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and McCarthy's former defensive coordinator, Dan Quinn, who is now the head coach of the Washington Commanders. Also, the GMs of the Packers, Commanders, and the Cowboys were all in attendance as well, plus dozens of other uh, NFL position coaches and scouts. There was at least one representative from all 32 NFL teams there to see um, these Notre Dame players participate in pro day. And that's really good. I think that is something you can sell in recruiting. And it's always great because Notre Dame did have a few recruits on campus this weekend, including Deuce Knight. So being able to see this all go down and see all the NFL scouts in attendance obviously goes a long way. But as for the players who participated, I think Audra Kestme had the biggest day of all. He made up for his bad day at the combine with a great performance highlighted by his 4.58 second 40 yard dash time. Let's be honest, Estimate really, really needed that. He had a rough day at the Combine. He ran a 4.71 40-yard dash, which I'm not going to lie, was pretty surprising. I didn't think he'd be a burner or anything like that, but I thought he was much faster than the number he put out there, and that 4.71 number was not a good sign, especially for running backs. Ryan Roberts from Irish Breakdown had this stat. Only two running backs that came out since the year 1999 had at least one 1,000-yard season. Those two were LeGarrette Blunt and Orlando Scary. And no running back has ran a 40 times slower than 4.65 and gotten drafted since 2015. But I think that's going to change, and a big reason why is because of what Audric Esme did at his pro day. I think his new 40 time, a 4.58, is way more indicative of the type of explosiveness and speed that he has. And I'll be honest, like before the season started, I didn't really think that he'd run a very fast 40, but 4.58 at a guy his size and his strength, uh, that's really, really impressive. And I think it's going to help him a lot. 
Once I saw him break off that huge run against NC State and run past some guys, including Peyton Wilson, the linebacker on NC State who ran a 4.44 40-yard dash, I was like, wow, man, he really does have a little bit more breakaway speed than I thought he did. So when he ran that 4.71, I was like, man, what, what happened there? And the weird thing is the uh, track at the Combine seems to be a lot faster. Guys seem to run faster at the NFL Combine than they do at their pro days, but that was not the case for Estime. I don't know if he was you know, dealing with an injury or something like that or just really didn't really get off a, a good break or anything like that. But um, now that he has this 4.58, I think that puts some concerns about his speed and his ability for his game to translate to the next level. I think some of that uh, is going to go away a little bit. I also thought that his, the rest of his workout was really solid. Um, he did great in the three cone drill and he was just really, he looked more fluid. He looked more comfortable. He looked more relaxed. And I think that's going to go a long way. And I feel like Audrey Gassime, he's always going to put on a great interview. He's a great person to talk to a great representative of the university of Notre Dame. And I think he's going to be uh, drafted probably in like the fourth round. I mean, you never know with the way that these NFL teams value running backs these days, but I thought he definitely made some money today with his performance at Pro Day. I also thought that Thomas Harper had a really good day, especially considering he wasn't even invited to the NFL Combine, so this was his one big opportunity to showcase the type of athleticism that he has, and he did that in a big way. He recorded a vertical of 42 inches at the Pro Day. That would have been uh, third at the NFL Combine for safeties, and the only two players who would have had a higher vertical jump had 42 and a half. So I thought that was really good. He also ran a 4.48 40-yard dash, and he had a seven-second three-cone drill. And I was really impressed by his 40-yard dash time. Like, I knew he was an athlete, but... 4.48 4.48 is hauling, and I never really looked at him as like a burner. He's a very physical player, just a really solid all-around football player, so that was great for him. I don't know if it's enough for him to get drafted. I mean, the fact that he wasn't invited to the Combine isn't a good sign, but there's plenty of guys um, at the later rounds who do end up getting drafted without the Combine invite, and even if he doesn't get drafted, I still think there's a great opportunity for Thomas Harper to make an NFL roster as an undrafted free agent. He's just a really good natural football player. I really don't know uh, how else to put it. He finished this past season with 25 tackles. He had a forced fumble, three passes deflected. He impacted the pass game and the run game with this play. And I would want Thomas Harper on my team. I'm not an NFL GM, but I think that that is the type of guy you want in your locker room. And I think he could definitely make a name for himself on special teams, something like that. Like that is a guy who I think is going to make it on a team. And also I think Sam Hartman looked good throwing the ball. I thought this tweet from Jim Nagy was uh, pretty telling. He's the executive director of the Reese's Senior Bowl, and he said that multiple scouts texted him that Sam Hartman had a really impressive throwing session. I don't really know how much a throwing session at Pro Day is going to help Sam Hartman considering how much football he has played. Like, there is so much tape on him already. I can't imagine that, like, an NFL scout is going to say, oh, well, we have five years of Sam Hartman playing college football. I'm going to lean more to on what he did in this Pro Day. So I don't know what that's going to do to his draft stock, but hey, like, it's better than having a really bad day. So good for Sam Hartman. It was cool to see him back. And another thing that I thought was pretty interesting when he was throwing was that Jaden Greathouse, Notre Dame's rising sophomore receiver, was one of the guys catching passes from him. That's pretty rare for a player who's still currently a freshman at the University of Notre Dame to be catching passes from the quarterback at Pro Day. Typically, that is reserved for veterans. Sometimes it's guys who have left the school and they're back on campus. But Sam Hartman clearly trusts Jaden Greathouse to run precise routes, and they have the timing down. And I think that's that's pretty important. I don't know if it's going to uh, change my outlook on Jane Greathouse, but it sort of makes me feel a little bit better about what his potential is for Notre Dame, the fact that Sam Hartman trusted him and the Notre Dame staff trusted him to go out and run those drills with him on what is still a very important day for Sam Hartman, even though he has a bunch of tape out there already. One last thing on the pro day. I'm a little bit disappointed. We're never going to see J.D. Bertrand run the 40-yard dash. It looks like he's still recovering from an injury that he suffered. Uh, some point during training, it might have happened during Senior Bowl week. He uh, had a boot on his leg. I think it was his right ankle when he was there at the NFL Combine, so he didn't really get to do anything there. Didn't really get to do a ton at Pro Day either, and I just felt like there's been so much discourse among the fan base about J.D. Bertrand and his athleticism or the lack thereof, according to some sections of the fan base, and I thought we were able to run the 40-yard dash and kind of quiet all that nonsense about his speed, then that would be a really just 
good thing for him and the people who have defended him like myself. But unfortunately, we're not going to get that um, unless for whatever reason he comes back for another pro day next year if he doesn't make it on an NFL roster. But I don't really see that happening. I think that J.D. Bertrand is an excellent football player. I don't know if he's going to get drafted or not, but he is going to find his way on an NFL roster because nobody is going to outwork him and spend more time in the film room and just doing everything that they possibly can to make it on an NFL roster and squeeze every possible ounce of skill on the field like J.D. Bertrand is going to do. So a little disappointed in that, but overall, I thought Notre Dame players had a really good day at the Pro Day, and uh, that's always good to see. It's a great representation of the program, and I'm excited to see where these guys end up getting drafted come April. All right, coming up next, it's time for the mailbag. This episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped lawnmowers 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code LOCKEDON for 20% off plus free shipping. Introducing the season's champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Hate making a mess? Not to worry. This bad boy is waterproof. Shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With great deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all of the fun you're going to have. I recently used Game Time to go to a concert. Wasn't in the plans initially, but then I looked at the price on Game Time. I was like, you know what? I'm in. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You get images of receipt before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Plus, you can buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Just two taps and you're set, and the tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, our first question comes from at McBride7. Which position group will have the biggest change after the spring transfer portal? I think the safe bet here is quarterback, right? Because one of Steve Angeli or Kenny Minchie is most likely not going to be on the roster following spring practice. And I think that if Steve Angeli decides to stay, then Kenny Minchie is probably going to enter the transfer portal because he's going to be into uh, his second year in college and he's going to be behind um, Angeli and Riley Leonard. And I just don't really know what the future is for him because if Steve Angeli is beating him out now, he's probably going to beat him out next year. And there's just not really a great path for Kenny Minchie, especially when he's got a really talented two freshman like uh, CJ Carr behind him and then Deuce Knight coming in. However, if Steve Angeli does decide to enter the transfer par- portal, assuming he loses out to uh, Riley Leonard to be the starting quarterback, then I think that Kenny Minchie is going to stick around. But either way, um, one, of her, uh, one of those positions is going to have a huge impact on the future of the Notre Dame quarterback position, even though it's just one player making that choice. Because let's say um, Steve Angeli decides to leave. I think Kenny Minchie is probably going to be the starting quarterback next season. If he leaves, you know, does that mean it's going to be Angeli? And what does that mean about C.J. Carr and his development? So whichever player, if they decide to leave, I think that's going to have a huge impact on the future. I also wouldn't be surprised if we see a running back or maybe a wide receiver enter the portal. I would say a wide receiver entering the portal is more likely just because I think they have 11 scholarship players in the room now. So that's a lot of guys. If you're uh, buried on the depth chart, you want to go find playing time elsewhere. Wouldn't be surprised if one of them left. Um, Also, on defense... Um, We could see maybe some movement at linebacker. I don't know. I I would be kind of surprised by that. But in terms of additions, I would say uh, the offensive tackle. If Notre Dame is able to go out and get a really good uh, starting offensive tackle in the transfer portal, that means that probably – you know, Tosh Baker, maybe Emil Wagner, one of those guys might leave if they get uh, surpassed by this transfer they bring in who is who would theoretically take over the starting job. But if it's not offensive line, I could see there being a new tight end, which actually leads me to my next question, which comes from Frank Sarah. Do you think Notre Dame will look to get a transfer tight end with the uncertainty of their health at the position? Before spring practice, I was leaning towards no, but given I, Eli Raritan's injury, and I, again, as of this this recording, we really don't know what Eli Raritan is dealing with. We just know that he has been limited so far in spring practice. And given the fact that Eli Raritan has suffered two ACL injuries, it's fair to be concerned. 
about whatever it is that he's dealing with. And I think we're going to get more information on this this weekend once Marcus Freeman has his press conference. And to be clear, he was at practice. He was suited up, but he was standing off to the side while the Notre Dame tight ends were doing some position drills. And I think that's pretty noteworthy. So let's say Eli Raritan is not healthy. Let's say he kind of just goes through the spring, doesn't really participate in the blue and gold game. I would say that Notre Dame definitely needs to add another body in that room. They're probably not going to get a starting caliber tight end. Um, I still think Mitchell Evans is going to be the starting tight end throughout this season. It seems like his recovery from the ACL injury that he suffered against Pittsburgh last season, uh, the recovery has been going really well so far. So he should be able to start for most of the season next year. But behind him, it's pretty dicey because you've got Eli Raritan, who, like I just said, is dealing with something and has an injury history. Kevin Bauman has an injury history. Cooper Flanagan, knock on wood, hasn't really dealt with anything, but he's only going to be a sophomore next season. And then behind him, you've got Jack Larson, the tight end. So there's not really a lot of reliable depth in that room. And I think that Notre Dame could potentially go out in the transfer portal and add a player who maybe they've been around a few years and they could be a good tight end two or even a tight end three. Like, I still think the future is really bright for Eli Raritan, but the injury history is a concern. And if he's not able to get out on the field, then like that potential really doesn't mean a whole lot. So like I said, I, I didn't think they would need one, but now given the Eli Raritan situation and the uh, ongoing stuff there, I think it's time to probably look for someone. I wish they went after Urasek, who is the tight end for Stanford, who actually killed Notre Dame a couple of years ago. He's a really good player. Now he's at Georgia. Maybe Urasek didn't want to be the tight end too to Mitchell Evans, whatever the case may be. It didn't seem like Notre Dame went after him that hard, but maybe that'll change with this new cycle uh, with a different tight end. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Okay, next question comes from Ryan Toussaint, who says, Freeman reported, quote, he fully expects Gabriel Rubio to be back with the team this summer. Though it initially sounds like good news, could this cause bigger issues down the road, such as others transferring out? And is there word on why Rubio is not with the team now? Um, I don't think this is going to cause any bigger issues down the road, to be honest with you, because Howard Cross and Riley Mills aren't going to transfer. Um, neither is Jason Anye. Jason Anye and Gabriel Rubio are good friends, and we found out this week that they're roommates. So those are going to be the four main defensive tackles this season, assuming that Gabriel Rubio is able to make his way back on the team. As for the younger guys, I don't think Donovan Heinish or Devin Houston would transfer because Rubio is coming back. Rubio is a little bit older, and I think Donovan Heinish, you know, you think about what his brother did for the University of Notre Dame. I don't see him as a guy who could leave, and Devin Houston is still very young. He's going to be going into his redshirt freshman season, so he's got a bunch of time left. I don't think that the Rubio news is going to change his mind. Now, I think D Tyson Ford might transfer, but I don't even think that has anything to do with Rubio. Tyson Ford is just buried on the depth chart. He's already been jumped by younger guys, including Donovan Heinish. Like when Gabriel Rubio, when we found out that he was stepping away from the team, I never even really considered Tyson Ford as a guy who could come in and replace him. And um, that just has to do with what the coaching staff or the way that the coaching staff used him last year. He only got 10 snaps on the season total. And as far as I know, wasn't dealing with an injury. I just don't think that Tyson Ford is going to be the player that we thought he could be when he was a recruit. He was a really highly touted prospect. Uh, Notre Dame was able, or really Marcus Freeman was able to steal him away from Oklahoma. But so far in his college career, it hasn't really panned out. Maybe that'll change. Um, so far, I haven't really heard anything about Tyson Ford in this spring practice, but maybe, you know, he changes his body and really climbs up the depth chart in fall camp. But I would say that Tyson Ford is probably a pretty likely candidate to transfer just given the fact that he is getting buried on the depth chart despite, you know, whether or not Rubio is there or not. It's just his path to playing time doesn't seem clear at the moment. Um, as for the reason Rubio is out, I think it has to do with academics because he's not enrolled in the university. Like, usually that's a sign. And I don't think he's suspended, right? Because if he was suspended, there's no way he would be watching practice uh, in street clothes. So my guess is academics, but I don't know for certain. And because of that, I don't really want to speculate beyond that because it's his business. And considering that information is pu not public, I'm not going to talk about it that much on this podcast. But we've got a few more mailbag questions to get to, including my all-time Notre Dame men's basketball team. That's next. 
This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Yukon Huskies can only be described as an armada. This top-seeded team is as hardcore as it gets out there, so it's no wonder they've landed the top overall seed in the NCAA tournament. They are one of the favorites to win it all, despite four of the six Power Six Conference champions standing in their way in the East region. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure shop nissanusa.com all right our next question comes from cole perlman if you had to bet on one player on the notre dame roster to eventually win the heisen who would you pick and why i thought about this a lot and i think it's just got to be cj carr because it's a quarterback award so if you take any other player from another position it's very unlikely to begin with and it's even unlikely for cj carr to win the heisen i think maybe the best bet outside of cj carr is riley leonard but uh, as much as I love for that to happen, I think if Riley Leonard won the Heisman, it'd mean great things for Notre Dame this season. I just, I just don't think he's good enough to win the Heisman Trophy. But hey, I'd love to be proven wrong in that. I never would have guessed that Jaden Daniels would end up winning the Heisman, but that's exactly what he did in this last season. He really improved as the quarterback at LSU, but it took him two years to do it. If Riley Leonard had one more year, I could actually maybe see it happening, but in his one year with Notre Dame, I just don't see it. So I think it's got to be C.J. Carr. Like, He's, he has a ton of potential. I think he's loaded with talent. And I feel like the, you know, the prestige and the fan base's feelings around CJ Carr and the fact that he's Lloyd Carr's grandson, like if he does take off in the college level and he ends up being a really good quarterback for Notre Dame, one, the fan base is going to be obsessed with him, right? Because, you know, he picked Notre Dame over Michigan and he has the Michigan ties and all that. He was committed to Notre Dame for a long time. He was a great leader in the recruiting class. He's been a great representative of the university so far. Like, he has all the makings to be a fan favorite. And then from the national perspective, the Notre Dame quarterback definitely holds a lot of weight. If he ends up putting up big numbers and Notre Dame is rolling, then he'll definitely be in the mix there at the end. So I think C.J. Carr uh, is probably the best bet there. If I were to pick another player outside of C.J. Carr, it's really tough, right? It'd have to be someone getting the ball a lot, scoring a lot of touchdowns. Right now, I feel better about the Notre Dame wide receiver room, but I don't think we're ever going to see like Jaden Greathouse win Heisman Trophy. So, and this is a real long shot, maybe Jadarian Price, if he just absolutely takes off and starts putting up like 20 touchdowns a year, uh, either this year or next year, maybe it could happen. But again, <clears throat> I don't really see any of that happening. It's probably going to be a quarterback if Notre Dame player ever does end up winning the Heisman again. So I'm taking CJ Carr. Okay, next question. Jamie Dolinger. What is the relationship like between Marcus Freeman and Pete Bavacqua compared to Freeman and Jack Swarbrick? Well, Marcus Freeman has said nothing but really positive about uh, positive things about Pete, which you know shouldn't be a surprise if Marcus Freeman came out and was like, you know, I don't really know if I trust Pete. I don't know if I, I don't know if he's qualified for the position. That would be the biggest story around Notre Dame. And obviously, he's never going to say that. Um, but I do think that Marcus uh, has a lot of trust in Jack Swarbrick. I mean, we know that they're very close. Both of them have been very open about that. They have a really good relationship, and they have a ton of belief in each other. So because of that, I think that Marcus Freeman has trust in Swarbrick for what is essentially his hand-picked successor. I don't know if Swarbrick was like, hey, this is the guy I want next, but I think that he was definitely a part of the process, and it's been a very collaborative transition between between Jack Swarbrick and Pete Bavacqua as he has taken over the role as, a, as, a, as athletic director at Notre Dame. So I think that they have a good bond, and I'm sure you know it's going to take some time for Marcus and Pete to really develop that level of trust and that relationship that they have with one another. But one thing I do know about Pete Bavacqua is that the guy absolutely loves Notre Dame, he loves the university, and he loves the football program, and he will do everything he can to help them succeed. I really don't think it's a stretch to say that Pete Bavacqua basically, it, his new role as athletic director was a demotion compared to being the chairman for NBC Sports. And that's a good thing. That means he wants to be at the university so bad and he wants to help the athletic department so bad that he was willing to take a job that probably requires a lot more work for less pay. But that's what he wants to do. And I know that Pete Bavacqua is a big, big football fan and has been his entire life. So it's kind of exciting to, to see a guy in that role who is so passionate and wants to see the football team succeed as well as every other uh, team on Notre Dame campus. So if Pete Vacqua is completely bought in and making the football program as successful as they possibly can be, 
that's going to make any football coach like you, especially Marcus Freeman. So I don't know that much about it right now, but I have high hopes for the future of that relationship and the future of that tandem at Notre Dame. All right, last one of the day. This is a good one. It comes from Nathan Coleman. In celebration of March Madness, make an all-time starting Notre Dame uh, lineup past and present. Nathan, I like that you included past and present, but considering what Notre Dame uh, men's basketball just did this past season, probably not going to be a player currently on the roster who makes the all-time starting lineup. Maybe if Marcus Burton stays four years and he ends up having an incredible career, hey, I'm not ruling it out. He could make his way into this starting lineup one day, but it's a little bit too early for that. So Adrian Dantley is no-brainer. Right. He, he's third all time in scoring. He's probably the best player to ever wear the Notre Dame f- uniform. He was amazing. And I think you got to get Luke Herringoti and Austin Carr as big guys. Austin Carr is also an all time great Cleveland Cavalier as a Cavs fan. Uh, that means a little bit more to me. And actually, Luke Herringoti was a member of the Cleveland Cavaliers in the very, very dark days post LeBron. But uh, yeah, his NBA career didn't really pan out. But man, he was an incredible college basketball player. His jump shot looked goofy as hell, and the fact that he was as good as he was was really shocking. But, man, that dude could fill up the cup at the college level. So I'm taking Dantley, Heron, Godey, and Carr. Guards are a little bit tough, man. I mean, do you want Chris Thomas or, or Jerry and Grant as the point guard? I think, you know, I'm a little bit biased towards Jerry and Grant because he was there when I was there, and he led uh, that team to the Elite Eight and nearly knocked off Kentucky, who, by the way, Kentucky basketball is dealing with, dealing with a little bit of problems these days. It's a far cry from that 38-1 and one team back then. But Grant was really, really good. But I, I just think that what Chris Thomas did at Notre Dame, he was a little bit more accomplished. He played more games, scored more points, all that. The stats, Chris Thomas is better. So I'm going to take Chris Thomas, even though that really hurts me because I absolutely loved watching Jerry and Grant, especially Jerry and Grant's comeback against Louisville uh, at the end of regulation when he basically scored eight straight points to send them into overtime. Then it went on to fifth overtime, five overtimes. And again, all-time game, but I'm getting sidetracked here. So that's four guys. I think I'm going to take Pat Connaughton as my fifth guy. Uh, Troy Murphy definitely has a case. Pat Garrity has a case. David Rivers, hell, even Bonzi Colson has a case. But I just, I just thought Pat... Connaughton did everything for that Notre Dame team. Like he's six foot four, led the team in rebounds, great defender, could shoot, could dunk, could drive the lane, could pass. He he did everything. So I think I'd want him on my team here as the three or maybe the two. Plus, he's made a really, really good career for himself in the NBA. I mean, he's been on the Bucks for a while. They've been one of the best teams in the NBA uh every single year. And he's an NBA champion, man. So I, I think I'm going to go with Dantley, Heron Godey, Carr, Thomas, and Connaughton. It's maybe not the five best players in Notre Dame history. I think, obviously, there are several of them in there. But I think that'd be a really good lineup, and that's who I'm picking. If you disagree, let me know. You tell me who your starting lineup would be, and then maybe we could discuss it on a future episode. But that is going to do it for today's episode. And that's another week of Locked on Irish Down. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Enjoy a great weekend of college basketball. This is one of my favorite weekends of the year. So I know I'm going to be watching a ton of hoops this weekend. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow the show on X at Lockdown Irish on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod. And my personal X account is at Tyler W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you next week.